OK. So I wrote already something on the blackboard. I can erase this one moment. And uh, so what we'll do today are five examples of concrete situations where we try to find a moduli space, a classifying space, a universal space in very different fashions. So the examples are quite opposite to each other. And you will see a little bit where the problems are. There are several and distinct problems. So we start very simple with triangles. We had this already last time. So I tried to get a pen which works better. OK. So for triangles in R2, A, B, C. So we have various ways of identifying triangles. We have congruence. And I want to distinguish between weak. Weak means that we allow not just movements in the plane, but we allow also reflections. And we could also take strict where we don't allow reflections, but just isometries, orientation-preserving isometries in R2. And then we have similarity, where we also allow to multiply our side lengths with a constant. So here, R star will act. Okay? You just stretch everything by a constant factor. OK? So <clears throat> we want to describe a little bit the space of all these triangles. And for simplicity, I will restrict to the case of similarity. So when we have now these equivalence classes, we are allowed to move the triangle, to rotate the triangle, and to reflect it. OK? So of course, the side lengths will determine almost completely our triangle. So what we do, we first fix the parameter equal to 1, just to fix ideas. Then we take the triangle inequalities as usual. Uh, a, a plus C. and a plus b. So these should here be strict, because we don't want at the moment degenerate triangles. And then, as we are allowed to permute by reflections the ordering of the sides, we can assume that a is less than or equal to b, less than or equal to c. So what do we get? We get the following shape in R3. We get the hyperplane in R3, given by a plus b plus c equals 1. And I will draw in this hyperplane the triangle defined by these inequalities. So we get something like this. So what does this mean here? I give you the coordinates of the vertices, 1 half. So I point here will have coordinates a, b, c. Okay. So we draw all points having uh, these properties here. So here we will have 1 quarter, 1 quarter, 1 half. And here the 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. Then this, the line here will correspond to a equal b. And this side will be b equals c. Okay. And then we have the, the rectangular triangles, which will be inside here. This is the curve defined by a square plus b square equals c square. And then 
in the region below, we will have an acute, non obtuse, obtuse angle. And here we will have an acute angle, only acute angles. Okay. So this is the region which classifies all these triangles. Okay. So of course, along this this side here, we will have equilateral triangles as well as here, whereas here would be degenerate. That's why this lower side, uh, side length side is not contained. So these are all triangles which appear like this. So you see that's a nice geometric object, but it is not really a variety or something. Okay. Now what would be a family continuous family of triangles? So we just take, I hope you can see this, we just take a curve inside here, a parametrized curve. Okay. Now I want to address already here one problem which occurs, which is due to this assumption here, a less than or equal to b less than or equal to c. Because imagine that we start with this type of triangle. So we have A, so my ordering is not correct. I think I want to have here C and B, A, C, B. And now we move this triangle, we deform this triangle as follows. Then in the middle we will have an equilateral triangle. And then we end up with a rectangular triangle again. Okay? A, B, C. Now here you see you have C larger than B, but here we have B larger than C. So this is a problem when we want to draw this in this curve. Okay? So of course you could say the two extremal triangles are similar to each other because we allow reflections. But if we don't allow reflections, this family will be a family where we cannot identify these two. Okay. Now, <clears throat> nevertheless, we could now, we could bend this family and bend it along a circle. So now we take instead of an interval as our parameter space, we take a circle and we take these extremal triangles here at the right and left hand end and we glue them together. And then we will get a family parametrized by S1, where we have kind of Möbius band. Yeah? And this will be a typical problem which occurs when one studies modular problems. So there is a whole story behind these triangles. I will give you references where you can read more about it. But today I want to stick to this and address a slightly more complicated example, which is similar to triangles. Actually. It's not just slightly more complicated, it's much more complicated. And it is the following. What about instead of triangles, we take tetrahedra in R3? So as you know, whenever you prescribe in a triangle, the side lengths with satisfying so whenever we have a b c and they satisfy the triangle inequalities we will find a triangle having these side lengths now let's go to tetrahedra. What about tetrahedra? We could take them in R3, but it would also work more gen generally n simplices in Rn. OK. 
Okay. And we want to classify all of them in a similar way as we did with triangles. So as you can see, even for tetrahedra in R3, that's not obvious. So what are the triangle inequalities? So the one thing which is clear, one thing which is clear is now maybe I, I draw one such tetrahedron. So we have the facets are triangles. I restrict to the case of dimension 3. You could think of dimension n, and I will give you a reference where you find dimension n. Now, very natural questions. Let capital A, B, C, D, the areas of these four triangles, then obviously we will have the same type of inequalities as for the triangle. Then you could call it the simplex inequalities. Namely, A will be less than B plus C plus D, and this cyclically. Obviously, no? the, the area above the, the lower triangle, the three areas must sum up to something which is larger than the smaller one, the one below. So I assume that all these inequalities are satisfied. We have four of these equalities. And the question is, does there exist a tetrahedron with these volumes or areas of facets. For any such A, B, C, does there exist a tetrahedron with these areas? So what do you think? Do we need extra conditions? Is there a solution? Is it obvious? Maybe there exists no solution. Do there exist many solutions? So a little bit of history. Uh, it's a, a funny history because this was the answer to this question was proven to be true in dimension three. So this was done by Kakea. in 1905, n equals 3. I will give you the reference, but the paper is in Japanese. Yes. This is true. It's not completely obvious. Actually, the proof is not at all such simple. And the interesting thing is that dimension n larger or equal than 4, took almost, no, actually it took more than 100 years to be solved. So this was done by another Japanese mathematician, Izumi, uh, in the proceedings of the AMS. OK. So, you get also a positive answer. Answer is again yes. 
you can try to prove it on your own, or at least the case n equals 3. And you send it to me, and we make a kind of competition. So the proof uses only linear algebra. And for those who are familiar, Minkowski type Minkowski type arguments. But of course, the shape of the facets, the shape of the triangles, is not determined. So we have infinitely many solutions. So we are far from having a system of representatives of equivalence classes of tetrahedron. Okay? So the moduli problem would consist in selecting for each a, b, c, d a distinguished tetrahedron. And maybe one has to impose additional conditions. So you see that just going one dimension higher makes life already quite difficult. And I want to give you a small idea how the, argument, the proof goes, because uh, it's, again, uh, a funny story which is behind. So now I have to draw again. So the, the type of argument which is used is uh, the following problem. Joseph Langre problem. So this was posed in 1953 and solved only in 1997. But when I explain you the problem, you will say I solve it until tomorrow. And it is elementary geometry. It goes as follows. You take a quadrilateral. So this has nothing to do with, with moduli. It's just for fun. I try to draw a big one. OK. So maybe you have an elegant proof. What you do, you take the bisectors of the sides. I have to cheat a little bit to get something reasonable. Here. OK. I hope you can see it. And this will give you another quadrilateral, which is a very small one, which I draw in blue. OK. Now, in this blue quadrilateral, you can take again bisectors. I draw them in small. It's maybe difficult to see, but I repeat. You start with the quadrilateral, you take the bisectors, 
Strecken symmetralen, you get another quadrilateral. You take from this quadrilateral the bisectors, and you get a third quadrilateral. Now I'm not able to draw it. Something inside here. So you start with q1. Then here we will have q2. And then we go to q3. And the problem of Langre was to show that q3 is similar to q1. It's amazing. It should be very easy. But apparently, either it was unobserved, but it was in the, in the notices of the American Mathematical Society, no, in the American Mathematical Monthly, so a lot of people are reading it. So you can try it on the computer to show that these are similar, which means similar just means that after suitable rotations, the sides are parallel. Okay? So that's a little bit about triangles. This will not be our main focus in this class, because it falls a little bit outside algebraic geometry, and we don't have too many techniques for it. But it's nice to have a look at it. OK, this was the first topic of today. The second one are lines and curves. Lines and curves in P2. So we want to classify or count or parameterize lines and curves in P2. And I start with something very simple. So P2, you can take it over the complex numbers or over the real numbers, projective plane. And I will denote by A2, let's say over C, just to the complex plane C2. Yes, please. As far as I know, only q3 is similar to q1. Yeah. So I think you can test it on the on a computer program easily. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, would q4 be similar to q2? Please don't ask me questions which I don't know to answer. Uh, to q2, yes, by the same construction. Yes, it's just a repetition. Yeah, and my question, the second question would be, I mean, you do this by dualizing twice, like going from lines to curves and then back again? Yes, so I had, didn't look up the proofs, yeah, but uh, it seems not so easy to, to prove it. Yeah? I am not aware how the proof goes. Yeah. I just want to, to put it as a side remark. Okay. So let's go to lines and curves in P2. First, uh, lines in A2 passing through 0. This will give us just a P1. We have seen this already. No? P1 is classifying all lines in A2 passing through 0. But what about arbitrary lines? What about affine lines in A2? Of course, this is again simple, but let's look at it. So now we, we have here the origin, and we look at lines, anything, and we want to parameterize them. So of course, to parameterize these lines, we could just take a point and a vector. So we would be in C2 times C2. But of course, uh, 
we have an equivalence relation because if the points lie on the same line, we get twice the same line. So this is too big. So we have here an equivalence relation. Yeah? And uh, the way out is very simple. We just take the equation for the lines. So here, algebra is very helpful. We just take ax plus by equals c. And now we already have the answer. Of course, a, b, c are only unique up to multiplying with a non-zero constant. So we get a, the projective point a, b, c will be a representative of each line. And this will be an element in p2. So here, if we take arbitrary lines in a2, we get p2 as a moduli space. Okay, So these lines in A2 passing not necessarily through 0, we could also take them as lines in P2 because we could also take the homogeneous equation, Ax plus By equals Cz, which is equivalent. And this will define a line in P2. Okay, So the lines in P2 correspond to the affine lines in A2. So <clears throat> lines in A2 or in lines in P2 are smooth curves. So we can, maybe I, so, uh, I was told that I should not write down here. So my space is even, my light board is even smaller. And I will have to erase quite a, often, but that's part of the story. So we can consider a line in A2 or a line in P2 as a smooth one-dimensional manifold, complex manifold. So <clears throat> we can consider smooth curves in P2 of genus 0. Now I'm not going to explain precisely what the genus is, but you have to imagine that this means that topologically, homeomorphic to S2, the sphere, the real sphere. So these curves are called rational curves. And uh, the equivalence relation are is given by birational equivalence in P2, which means maps from P2 to P2, which are given by quotients of polynomials. Okay, And then if the genus is 0, if you have such a curve C, then it's easy to show that the, actually all these are isomorphic to a P1 in P2. So that's <clears throat> not really very fascinating yet, because you just have one candidate. But it is interesting if you just look at it topologically. So P1 is, now I just draw this symbol to S2 topologically. Uh, and this gives rise to the notion of exotic sphere, Sn. Now I go 
in dimension higher. So the first part up here was algebraic geometry. Now we are in topology, exotic spheres. The question is the following. If x is a manifold, homomorphic to Sn, is it already diffeomorphic? This was a, and this still is a very active area of research, and it gave rise to at least three Fields medals. So Milner, again, this is a classification problem. Milner constructed counterexample in dimension 7, which are the famous exotic spheres of Milner. And he got the Fields medal. And uh, then you can impose additional conditions. You can impose that it's not that your manifold is not just homeomorphic to an n-dimensional sphere, but that it is, has even the homotopy type. So there's a homotopy between the sphere and uh, the manifold. So the, the senior people among you certainly know this story. So if x homotopy equivalent to Sn, so for those who are not familiar with homotopy equivalence, that's a stronger condition, stronger than homeomorphic. One could again ask whether x is actually equal to Sn. Then it was Smale. So the question is whether this implies that x is diffeomorphic. Sn. Smale did dimension n uh, larger than 4. Friedman dimension n equals 4, which is harder and still harder is dimension 3. n equals 3. So that's a phenomenon which is well known in topology that the small dimensions are often harder to check and to prove than the large dimensions. May I ask a question about this? Uh, Milner constructed counterexample in uh, if these methods are finished already. What, what is finished? Uh, yes, the sentence, like, uh, so Milner constructed a counterexample in what? In dimension 7. Ah, OK n equals 7. Okay. So this was the case. So this was a sidestep again, as we like to do. So we were studying or looking at smooth curves of genus 0. And now we look at smooth curves of genus 1. Smooth curves in P2. Let me do it over the complex numbers of genus 1. So this is a smooth complex curve. So as a real manifold, it is a differentiable manifold, a differentiable surface. And topologically, 
one knows that this is just a torus in R3. Okay. And maybe the theory of these smooth curves of genus 1 in P2 is one of the most beautiful subjects in mathematics and in the theory of moduli. The, the famous naming is the theory of elliptic curves. And of course, I'm not going to give a whole course on elliptic curves. And you don't, know, you don't have to know what the genus is. I will give you just enough information so that you see where the classification problem is and how it is solved. So for curves of genus 1, for elliptic curves, the classification is completely done. It's already classical. And it's quite surprising how it works. Moreover, it has various different approaches. There is the approach from algebraic geometry. There is the approach through complex analysis and via stress p functions, p function. And there is also the approach using lattices. So I will start very elementary, very elementary, as follows. Elliptic curves. So how do we define an elliptic curve? E. This will be the zero set in P2. We take projective coordinates. Let me do it over the complex numbers. f of x, y, z equals 0, where f is a homogeneous polynomial. Of degree 3 or 4 and such that the zero set v of f is smooth. So it's a manifold. And this just means that if you look at the common zeros of f and you set it equal to the partial derivative, then it has only solution 0, 0, 0. And this does not lie in P2. Okay, So it's a condition. And I will make it more precise on the partial derivatives of f. And that's an elliptic curve. It has nothing to do with the geometry of an ellipse a priori. But there is a strong relation with ellipses and arc lengths. OK. So such an elliptic curve is not just a set. It comes with a distinguished point, e, and let me call it 0. Often this is also placed at infinity, is a curve plus a distinguished point. So. If you take now a homogeneous polynomial in three variables, you have a lot of them. But of course, many of these polynomials will define the same elliptic curve, obviously. So you have the notion of isomorphism. Yeah? So equivalence, e prime, there exists a linear coordinate change. Or if you prefer, you can take all the birational coordinate change in A2. So we embed A2 into PC, P2. Yeah, we can, this curve, almost everything of this curve lies in A2 in the affine plane. And just the point at infinity lies in P2 at the boundary. <coughs> 
that we call it phi with e prime equals phi of e. And this, again, can be expressed in terms of birational maps of P2. Birational map of P2. So, <clears throat> don't you want uh, don't you want O to be mapped O prime? Yes, thank you. Mapping O to O prime. Of course, this is again a selection. We could any preferred point, of course, but like this, it's better. And now you want to find a nice equation that the first kind of elementary object, objective. And uh, <clears throat> many, many people have tried to find a nice f. So that's maybe the, the starting point of moduli theory. If you work with an arbitrary degree four polynomial in three variables, homogeneous, you have many, many coefficients. So what you try to do is you to try to eliminate these coefficients. So the goal is find a normal form. Find nice normal form for f always with respect to this equivalence relation. And there are many of them. There are many of them, and they carry separate names. So the usual one is the following. So this would be the, just a second. Where am I? So three, at least three candidates. So there's the Weierstrass normal form. And it depends a little bit on your taste. And it also depends what you want to do with it. But there's the following. It's always for f. And I'm not going to show why this is like this. y squared equals x cubed minus ax minus b. A, B, in C. So that's already quite nice compared to a degree 4 polynomial in three variables. So this is, of course, now the I have put z equals 1 because I work in affine. I work in A2 to simplify my life. And the only condition is that this guy here should have three distinct roots, three distinct roots. And that's equivalent to E of f smooth. We are working over the complex numbers in characteristic 2. That's a little bit more complicated. Then we have the Hessian normal form. So the Weierstrass normal form is maybe the most frequent one. Almost everybody is using this. But the Hessian normal form in a certain extent, is nicer. It looks like this. It is. Now, this is in, again, whenever I use z, I mean that I'm in homogeneous coordinates, equals d, x, y, z. And here, the condition of smoothness is just expressed that d square is not 1. And then we have the Linus normal form. Which is similar to this one. It is again assigned x plus 1, y plus 1, x plus y plus alpha equals cxy. So this is again affine. So you see, these two here, the last two, they are symmetric in x, y, and z. Well, that's a certain advantage. 
And uh, sometimes they are easier to compute. And then the last one, it doesn't have a name, but I found it in a wonderful paper of Edwards. And the references will appear on the website. This is, again, quite different. So I will call it EA. And the equation is x squared plus y squared equals a squared plus a squared x squared y squared. And the condition is that a to the fifth is different from a. This is, again, for smoothness. So you see, you have very different shapes of a normal form. All define the same object, but of course, you have to switch the parameters conveniently. And you don't know which one is better. So this one, the last one, is convenient for the group law. So you may have heard that elliptic curves have this fantastic property to allow an addition. And this addition can be defined algebraically if you define it in the Weierstrass normal form. The formulas are quite complicated. But if you do it in the Edwards form, things are much easier. So the addition law for EA is the following. So we, I do it in the affine setting. I want to add two points with coordinates x, y, and z, w. And this should end up in the point inside EA. So I just have to indicate the formulas for u and v. So u will be 1 over a x w plus z y divided by 1 plus x y z w. And v is 1 over a y w minus x z, 1 plus x y z w. So that's a beautiful formula. And uh, this formula appears already in the work of Carl Friedrich Gauss. So he already considered this in the case where a, I think he took a equals i, square root of i. And then he realized that this addition law is very similar to the addition law of sine and cosine. Compare this addition law. for sine and cosine. So I will give you the reference to the article of Edwards. I cannot write down everything on this board, because otherwise I will never end of erasing. But uh, I want to, to tell you a little bit about, more about this story. So what would be now in these four normal forms, the parameter which characterizes the elliptic curve up to equivalence, up to isomorphism. So what are the moduli? What would be a moduli space for such elliptic curves? And that's when I saw it for the first time, I, was, I think I did not really realize that that's very surprising. Because there's a single number which tells you the equivalence class of an elliptic curve. And I will just do it 
for the Weierstrass normal form and the Edwards form, and this is the famous J invariant. The J invariant, so this is a number in C, describes uniquely the equivalence class of an elliptic curve. And I will tell you what the J invariant is algebraically. So for Weierstrass, J is up to a scalar multiple, which I don't care about. It would be A cubed, A cubed minus 27B square. Miracle. No? Not clear how to find it. It's not very, very difficult to prove that whenever two elliptic curves have the same J invariant, they are isomorphic to each other and conversely. Okay. That's one way to define the J invariant. If you want to see it in terms of Edwards, you can also define it directly, and it is the same. After computation, you get uh, J, I think I have here 1 over 108. If I'm not, no, 16. Henry. Yes? Uh, you write it down so low, you cannot read it. At least I cannot read it. I cannot read the last line. You can read Weierstrass? Weierstrass? Yes, I can. OK. Below that, I cannot. So I will try to. Maybe I should, ah, maybe because the camera is not correctly. Let me see if this helps. Better? Can you see now the last line? <laughs> yes, so yes, we have to live with it, I think. I'm sorry, but we are still working on it. The problem is that the, the camera is too close, and we cannot move it further because the room is not bigger. So, OK. So for Edward, here you can read, I hope. In any case, this is the optimum I can write, because up there I cannot. So for Edwards, you get j. Now, this is a different a. I erased it. j would be, now this constant, I think it is maybe 16, I think, times, so this is now a to the 8. So this is the a of Edwards formula, plus 14a squared, no, a4, plus 1 cubed a4 times a4 minus 1 to the fourth. So you see, the formulas are quite different. Uh, of course, the A's and the B's play a different role. But in both cases, you would not guess that this is invariant. So E isomorphic E prime, J equals J prime, and conversely. That's the big theorem. Okay. So you have one number which tells you how the curve looks like. So I'm not sure if I will make a break today. We, no, I don't make a break today. We have half an hour more. In any case, I am late. So I t told you before that there is a kind of big story behind elliptic curves. And one is lattices. There is a description of 
elliptic curve by lattices. So that's pure, I would even say, combinatorics or linear algebra. And you do the following. So you take L in, now you're in R2, which you identify with C, a two-dimensional lattice. Those who have seen elliptic curves, maybe it's a little bit boring, but in any case, it's a beautiful theory. So this is just generated z alpha diagram z beta. And you assume that alpha over beta is not in R, so they are not proportional. And then, of course, you can rotate and stretch this lattice. And so you get, without loss of generality, you can write this as L tau, which is z times 1 plus z tau. So here you have 1, and here you will have tau. And then you get the usual drawing of the lattice. Everybody has seen this, and so on. Okay. And you can declare two lattices to be equivalent. L tau equivalent L tau prime, if and only if. You can multiply 1 by a complex number, C in C star, such that L tau prime equals C times L tau. That's a kind of natural equivalence relation. And this equivalence relation can be expressed in terms of tau. Now I will again have A, B, C, D. Apologize for multiple notation. So this will be now a matrix in SL2 with integer entries, such that tau prime equals A tau plus B, C tau plus D. But this, this quotient here, we have seen it already. This is, again, a Möbius transformation. So it pops up here quite naturally. This tau here is in the upper half plane. So here we have the upper half plane, the open upper half plane. And tau is in h. Okay, And it turns out that SL2z acts by this formula. SL2z acts on h by these transformations. Okay. Now, how is this related to elliptic curves? Now I can write here, I hope. You take the following two numbers. You take g2. What is the factor? I think it's 60. You take all, let me call them alpha different 0, alpha in L. Now I just take one lattice. And you take uh, ba -bum, 1 over alpha 4. Let me check a second in order not to make a mistake. Yes, alpha to the minus 4. And g3 is uh, 140. These are these Eisenstein series, alpha in L, alpha to the minus 6. And then you will get an elliptic curve. get E of L, which will be defined by y square equals x cubed minus g2x minus g3. Elliptic graph. 
and uh, doing this, E L will be isomorphic to E L prime if and only if L is equivalent to L prime. Okay. So that's something mathematicians like a lot. They have two very different objects. And they have an equivalence relation on one side of the object and on the other side of the object. And the two equivalence relations correspond to each other. And that's here the case. That's a striking example that objects of a very different type may be related. And uh, discovering this must have been very exciting. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is much more to elliptic curves. You can do it arithmetically over finite fields. You can do it geometrically using the Weierstrass p function. Lots and lots of theory. The j invariant can also be expressed in terms of the lattice. I don't give you the formula. So <clears throat> everything fits together. There are not so many theories in mathematics where so many things come together. So I'm not going to finish with my program today, but I want at least give you a completely different type of equivalence relation uh, and moduli problem. So studying elliptic curves, these are projective curves in P2. So that's a global object as the triangles. No? You compare two global objects with each other by an isomorphism of the ambient space. So this is really trying to find a parameter which for each value of the parameter, you get precisely one equivalence class, which the parameter is here, this j invariant. There are different approaches to study moduli. And there is also a local version. And I'm going to start, at least today, to describe you a local moduli problem, which is then not called moduli problem anymore, but which gives rise to, again, very nice results and many surprising phenomena. And this is the theory of deformations. So I invite you to look a little bit at the literature I'm indicating to you, because uh, in this first part of the class, where I'm mostly telling stories, I'm not going to do all the technical details. So the next example will be what is called simple singularities. And this is a topic which has been very, very fashionable in the 1970s, 1960s. And uh, maybe the, the story started with Vladimir Arnold in, this was in 1979. Sorry, this was not in 1972. And I already mentioned this article of Durfee, which is called 15 characterizations. And so on. Okay. And again, if you look at the article of Arnold, every student could, can understand it, doesn't need any technique, almost nothing, and the computations are not obvious, they are complicated, but nothing deep. So what is the situation? Let me start like this. We are now in the complex analytic setting. Locally at 0. 
So everything is local. And we will consider a holomorphic map. I write it like this, C3 to C. So this means that f is defined on some u inside C3 and goes to C. And this is an open neighborhood of 0. Okay. So that's what is called the germ of holomorphic function. I'm only looking locally at 0. And then I get the 0 set, x in C3, f of x is 0. And again, locally, we look at it only locally at 0. So this is a hypersurface. It has dimension 2. f is, of course, assumed not to be constant, and it's not interesting. And you can imagine that f is just a polynomial. Okay. You define a hypersurface in C3 by a polynomial in three variables, and you look at it locally in the Euclidean topology. Now you declare, if I call this capital X, you declare X equivalent to Y. And of course, this is your choice of equivalence relation. Uh, there exists a phi from C3 to C3, a coordinate change, biholomorphic. And again, by this I mean in a neighborhood of 0, this is defined sending x to y. Okay. So <clears throat> imagine this is your x. Here you have the origin. And then you are looking in a small ball in C3. You are just interested at this singular point, if there is some singular point. Okay. Now, if if dx f 0 or dy f 0, dz f 0, one of these non-zero, not all 0, then v of f is a manifold at 0. So that's kind of the generic case. Okay. Otherwise, you may have uh, such a picture. There are many other pictures. Okay. And uh, of course, the point here will be called a singularity. And it's obvious that you will never be able to classify all f's because there are just too many. Uh, so you want to classify something which may be is simple-minded. Okay. And Arnold had the following idea. idea. He said, <clears throat> I want to classify those x or those f, which are the simplest one in a certain hierarchy. So the simplest one, simplest x, again, locally at 0, means that x is smooth. And the second simplest one is based on the following observation, which is a philosophical observation. If we have f of x from c3 0 to c, and if we so f, think of a polynomial. And in this polynomial, you start to change the coefficients. So deform f <coughs> to a family ft such that f0 equals f. I give you an example. Now I will write f x y z because I need three variables. You take x square y plus y cubed plus z square. And now you take your deformation x, y, z 
x square y plus y square, you introduce a parameter by adding here just plus tx. When t is 0, this disappears and gives you f. Okay. Of course, you could also take here maybe 1 plus t as a coefficient of y square, but I don't want to do it. Or well, maybe we do it. It doesn't matter. It's also OK. Plus 1 plus t. Now you cannot read this, but I hope you, you heard me. Okay. This is what is called a deformation, and t is close to 0. To 0 in c with respect to the Euclidean topology. Now, what do you see in this example? That the ft for t non-zero, xt will be smooth. Because here, the derivative will give you something non-vanishing, namely just t. Okay. So that's a very special case. In general, it need not be smooth, but the observation of Arnold is under deformation, under small deformation, the singularities at 0 of xt become better or stay the same. So what does it mean to stay the same? To stay the same means that xt is equivalent to x0, and better is not defined yet. You can make it precise, but that's uh, kind of complicated. So. In general, when you deform such a holomorphic function by a parameter t, you get many, many different equivalence classes. So I will give you a very heuristic drawing explaining what I mean. In the back of our equivalence relation here, we have a group acting. And being equivalent means that the objects are in the same orbit. So if you draw a group action, the orbits of a group action like this, of course, this is a very, very simplified picture. So this would be g times an element y, let's say. Well, g is acting on some space, and y is an element. And if you pick one element, and if you take now a, a deformation, let me call this element here z. Now, if you move z a little bit, this means introducing this t, then you will get something like a small curve, like here. Okay. So this would be the curve z t corresponding to our f t here. And what you see is that this curve will intersect infinitely many orbits. Because, of course, in this stupid picture, the orbits are kind of dense. Now, what Arnold observed is that in the setting of these holomorphic functions ft here, there are cases where ft intersects only finitely many orbits. And that's his definition. f is called, f or x is called a simple singularity if any deformation ft of f, t in c, close to 0 shows only 
finitely many equivalence classes. So these are the lowest one in the hierarchy. Yeah? So again, when you deform, you get something simpler in a certain sense, something better. But it could be infinitely many different types. But if below something there are only finitely many, you must be already very low in the hierarchy. And something low in the hierarchy will be the simplest object to classify. So once you have this definition, the theorem is that these simple singularities allow a fantastic classification. Simple singularities can be classified. So that's as follows. You have AK. All are polynomials, xk plus don plus y square plus z square, k at least 1. dk, which is xk minus 1 plus xy square plus z square, k at least 4. And then we have three exceptional e6, x cubed plus y4 plus z square, e7 x cubed plus xy cubed plus z square. You see the z square is kind of dummy always. And e8, yes? e7, but you don't care about the formula. But in any case, x cubed plus x cubed y. No, y cubed plus z square. Can you read it here? And e8, e8 is a x3 plus y5 plus z square. So I'm almost finished with my time. So you get a finite list, and you have two series here, parameterized by integers, k, positive integers, a, k, d, k, and you have three exceptional ones. Now next week, I will tell you a little bit about this list. But for today, I will just finish with a picture. I will draw some graphs associated to these, to these families. So you can associate to these polynomials what is called Dinkin diagrams. Some of you have heard about Dinkin diagrams. And they are AK looks like this. It's just a bamboo. With K vertices, DK has one ramification. And then we have the three exceptional ones, e6, e7, and e8. Yeah, these are the Dinkin diagrams. I will tell you a little bit how you construct these from the polynomials. But these Dinkin diagrams, they appear in the classification of, okay. of simple Lie algebras. So these are also the Dinkin diagrams of root systems of simple. Of fine, uh, yes, yeah, simple Lie algebras, but simple in a different sense. Lie algebras. So, in a completely con different context, you construct also diagrams 
And you get the same as here. Okay. So that's, I think that's very beautiful. It's not, I mean, there are many, many papers about this correspondence between Lie algebras, Lie groups, and uh, simple singularities. The 15 characterizations I mentioned before describe 15 characterizations inside this context, not talking about Lie algebras, but just about holomorphic functions. Okay. So I think I want to, to give you a homework. It's not an exercise, but I think you cannot resist uh, because the answer is, again, I think quite nice. Find all connected finite graphs, no loops, no double edges with labels alpha at vertices, alpha in R, such that you have to normalize. So the sum of the alpha should be 1. And the key condition is and alpha equals 1 half the sum of all labels beta, beta different from alpha, a neighbor vertex of alpha. This has to do, of course, with root systems. Uh, you can take integer or rational numbers alpha. And when you try to characterize these graphs, I can tell you already the answer. You get precisely these here. Okay. We forget about the labels, and you have these. Okay. I think my time is over. Sorry for the technical complications today. I hope this will improve, but we are restricted here a little bit. So <clears throat> I will put, first I will send you the link to the recording. Second, the notes of last week are almost finished, and I will put them online. And I will also add the references, the various papers. Of course, you will not be able to read all of them, but maybe you want to have a look at one or the other. And again, I want to encourage you to send me email or to write me and to tell me a little bit, give me a little bit of feedback if you find it interesting and what we could improve. OK, so thank you for joining today. And uh, see you next week. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Th